If you know me, you, you know this. If you don't know me, then you don't know this. That's a stupid way to start. Anyways, um, but I am a big fan of like nerd culture stuff, as in things that are, are tend to be a little more nerdier. I like it. Like um, Star Wars, I'm in. I like it. I like Star Wars, um, except for the original, the first three, episode one, two, and three. Those are terrible. And the new three. I only like the original trilogy of Star Wars because it's, that's what you do if you're a Star Wars guy. Um, I am a big superhero guy. I um, like comic books. Uh, I like all those Marvel type movies. And there's one movie that I remember being so excited for because um, it is my superhero, and that's Batman. Big Batman guy. Um, my, so my son is also a Batman guy because he has to be, okay? He has to like Batman, and he has to like the Ravens. If he likes the Steelers, he's kicked, he's kicked out of the house at three years old, okay? Um, so as a Batman guy, um, I remember when they announced the movie that was coming out called Batman vs. Superman. And I was so excited to see this movie. And I'm a more optimistic type guy. Like, if I'm excited for something, normally it, I, can, I will like it at the end. The rest of our staff is not as optimistic as I am. Frank, um, when we talk about Raven stuff, he's always like, yeah, that guy always gets hurt. It's like, thanks, Frank, for showing up for this. Um, Michelle's really optimistic, and Lauren, I call her buzzkill Lauren sometimes because we'll have an idea. She'll be like, that sucks. I'm like, okay, thanks, Lauren. And she's right, but she didn't have to be so blunt about it. So, um, so normally, if there's a movie I'm excited about, normally it takes a lot to disappoint me because I'm excited for it, and I want to enjoy it. I want to have fun. I'm, I'm that type of guy. I want to have fun when I go. So we went, and we saw Batman vs. Superman. Some of you have seen it. Some of you have not. If you have not, don't waste your time. And I remember leaving the movie theater, because I was, I was, when I tell you I was excited, I was Googling Batman every day to see any news articles that come out for a year. No joke, okay? That's how excited I was about this movie. It's like, oh, it's going to be awesome. And then I remember leaving the theater just being like, I mean, it was, it was good, right? And my brother's like, yeah, it was, it was good, right? And we're like, and we eventually got to the point where it's like, it was not good. And this whole time I had been waiting and so excited, and Frank's like, yeah, it sucked. I'm like, thanks, Frank, for showing up. <laughs> Every once in a while, you'll be excited about something, and you have expectations about something, and whatever that is doesn't meet those expectations. That excitement that you had goes away. Maybe for you, someone said, hey, you need to go to this restaurant. You, you're going to love this restaurant. And you go, and you're like, I mean, it was fine, but they built it up so much that also now you don't like, you didn't, the food didn't meet that level, so it did not meet your expectations. Maybe it's a, a band or a TV show or a movie that's like, hey, you've got to see this, and you finally see it, and you're like, I don't I like it. it. It didn't meet my expectations. Maybe it's an event, like you were uh, going to go to this uh, festival or, or a party, or you're going to go do something, and then it just wasn't as fun as you were hoping it would be. Maybe it's a place you say, hey, you need to go to vacation down here in Savannah, Georgia, or Charleston, or whatever, and you go and you're like, yeah, it was fine, but it didn't meet my expectations. And you know what? There are also times that we have high expectations when it comes to just our life. And then we're let down. You thought things would be better than they really are. You may have achieved what you were hoping to achieve, but that satisfaction that you were expecting to have from that achievement isn't necessarily there. And you think, well, you know, once I get here, then I'll finally feel content and fulfilled because that this is what I need, and then this is my expectation. I'm going to really feel fulfilled because of this. And then we get there, and that feeling's gone. Maybe for you, you couldn't wait to get married. Your whole life, you were, you were just dating and like, I can't wait to find that person, that soulmate, that one. And when I finally find them, that we're going to be happy ever after. And now that you're married, you don't feel as happy and as content as you thought you would. You don't feel... That, that, that expectation did not meet it. Maybe you kept dreaming about having kids. You kept dreaming and dreaming and dreaming about having kids, and then you finally have kids, and you don't have that feeling that you thought you would have. Instead, that feeling of stress and worry and anger, and you realize how impatient you are. Maybe that's you. Maybe if you, you keep praying for that new job because your current job is just so bad, once you get that new job, everything will be taken care of. My life will be so much better because I have this new job. And then you get that new job and you still feel like something is missing. And a lot of our lives aren't what we expected it to be. We thought we would feel better than this. So what do we do with that feeling? Here's how a lot of us cope with not meeting an expectation and not feeling satisfied in life and not feeling fulfilled. We cope with one word. That word is someday. It's okay that I don't feel this way because someday I will. 
It's okay that I'm not fully satisfied right now because someday I will. Someday I'm going to have that relationship that I've been dreaming about, that relationship that will finally make me feel whole. I know I don't feel it today, but someday I will. And when that comes, I'll finally feel fulfilled. Someday I will have that perfect job that truly makes me feel important. Someday I will have enough money and I won't have to worry about finances anymore because someday I'm going to have that and then everything else will be easier. Someday I will have the perfect house and everything goes smoothly and the water heater never breaks and we never have to fix the windows and the basement never floods. Someday I'm going to have that, but right now I don't. But someday I will. Someday I'm going to feel whole and complete and satisfied and fulfilled someday. So we dream about someday so that we can get through our boring, mundane life that isn't meeting our expectations, that isn't what we thought it would be. But the problem is someday never comes. Someday will never come. It's just the way that we cope with what's happening now. And a someday mentality, it belittles and it minimizes today. That's the problem with a someday mentality. It belittles and minimizes today. I remember um, when I was single, I was like some of you that are single. I would, could not wait to get married. I remember feeling that way. I, I, was, I was looking, I was trying to find that person, that, that Mrs. Wright, the, the one that I was going to find. I, I was trying to find that person because someday I was going to be married and be fully happy and fulfilled, and I, I couldn't wait to do that. So um, even as early as college, I remember dating people, and my whole mindset was when I date someone, I'm dating them um, with the hope that um, we are going to get married one day. Like, that's, that's my thing. And that may, might come from, like, my youth group background. That might come from some of those things, from Kiss Dating Goodbye book. Like, those, it might come from that, right? So, um, so I remember thinking, I, I need to find that person. When I start dating someone, I'm dating them because I potentially want to get married to somebody, and this is me seeing if I want to get married. So for a while, I would go to different relationships. I would like people that didn't necessarily like me back. I would like them maybe a little too long and wouldn't be able to get past them. And then eventually, um, I met Erica. I met Erica at a housewarming party. And um, when she was there, she had already met my brother, who's two years younger than me, um, who was a pastor in Ellicott City. And when I walked down the steps, she tells me that she said, oh, Shane has a brother, because she didn't know. And I hear, oh, Shane has a brother. That's what I heard. Went to so I eventually started talking to her. We eventually went on dates. We eventually started dating. We eventually got uh, engaged. Um, after five months of dating, we got engaged way too fast. And then we got married after eight months of being engaged. Um, again, way too fast. Um, and then we got married. And we've been married for 10 years now. And that dream of being married, thinking, oh, that's going to finally fulfill me, all my loneliness, all, all my problems that I have, all the things that I struggle to not look at late at night, all those things are going to go away once I get married. And then I got married. And that first year in, being married to someone that I still love a lot, 10 years in, first year I was like, oh, this isn't supposed to fulfill me. I still have my struggles. At times I still feel lonely, even though I'm in love with my wife. What's happening here? Because it was never meant to fulfill me. My idea of someday started to belittle today. When you always are hoping for someday, you miss what God is trying to teach you today. Andy Dwyer from The Office says it this way. I wish you knew you were in the good old days before you left it. I mean, even if you look at the Old Testament and the Israelites are, are wandering in the, in the desert, um, they are free from Pharaoh, Moses, Red Sea, you know those, that story, the Ten Commandments, and then they are, they're in the desert and they wander for 40 years until they get to the promised land. They're promised they're going to get there. 40 years they wander. But God says, hey, even though you're in the promised land, you're not there yet, someday you'll be there. I want you to practice like you're in the promised land now. I want you to live today like you're already there because I'm going to teach you something today. You see, God wants to teach you today. He wants to grow you today. God doesn't waste any time or any aspect of our lives. God isn't the God of someday. He is the God of today. So don't minimize the joy and the growth of today. So how do we stop living a life all, all about someday when we don't feel fulfilled today? How do we even do that? Well, in John chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, open up, you can open up the John chapter 4, your Bible apps. The author of John, which is most likely John, um, he wrote an encounter that Jesus had um, with a woman who felt like a lot of us do, who felt like maybe someday, someday I will be there. I will feel satisfied. 
but today felt unfulfilled and dissatisfied. So John chapter 4, we're going to start at verse 4. If you have your Bibles, your Bible app will be able to screen as well. Now, he had to go through Samaria. He is Jesus. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now, that's important to understand. It was about noon. This is a key point because that means it is the middle of the day. That means it is the hottest possible time of the day. My wife and I, for our 10-year trip, we went and got um, pictures in Savannah, Georgia. Because it was my idea. I figured, let's all take pictures. That wasn't my idea. I just, I'm a good husband. In 10 years, I learned, yeah, just say yes to that. And so we dressed up, and I wore jeans um, and a longer shirt that I pulled up. And I'm sure the picture will be on Facebook at some point. And it was 106-degree heat index that day. And we were dying. Like the whole time we're just wiping the sweat and then trying to smile with sweat all over us. It was terrible. Anyways, right now, it is the hottest part of the day, okay? It's noon is what you need to understand. It is the hottest part of the day. Verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. So a Samaritan woman came to draw water at noon. Again, the hottest part of the day. This was a time that no one came and drew water. Why? It was the hottest part of the day. Why would you go at the hottest part? It was miserable. You would go early because it wasn't as hot. But she came at the hottest part of the day, a time where she knew no one would be there. Why? We'll unpack that later. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. A little history here. Uh, Jesus comes and asks for a, dr- for a drink, which to us seems innocent. He's just saying, hey, can I have some water? But that day and age, it was not. And here's why. She's a Samaritan woman, and Jesus was a Jew. Jews and Samaritans hated each other back then. It can be traced back all, to the, all the way to the Old Testament when the kingdoms were split, when the Israel, kingdom of Israel was split. Um, so when you think of Jews and Samaritans, you can think of Ravens and Steelers. You can think of Yankees and Red Sox. Think of Taylor and Kanye, okay? That's what you can think of. That's the fight. They hated each other. If you were a Jewish man, you would never talk to a Samaritan woman. It just didn't happen. You would never be caught dead talking to a Samaritan woman, but not Jesus. He asked her for a drink of water. Verse 10. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would, not, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them, will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So what's happening here? Jesus is telling this woman that what he can offer her is far better than anything else that this world has to offer her. He is telling her that the well that she is at will quench her physical thirst for a little while, but she will be thirsty again. But he can fulfill her in a way that she will never thirst again. All of us search for meaning and for purpose, no matter your religious beliefs. We see people desperately, we see people desperately search for what they think will bring them happiness, what they think will bring them that, that water that will, they will never thirst again. We see them do that, and yet they still feel empty, and that's what she's doing. And she's saying, how could you give me this living water? Verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. You can almost like feel her desperation in her voice, right? Yeah, I want that. Get, I'll take that. Please, I want that. So here's what, how Jesus responds in verse 16. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you are now with is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. We see a woman here, a Samaritan woman, who is drawing water the hottest part of the day, who has had five husbands and is currently with someone that's not her husband. This is what we need to understand. In our culture, we would see that, like, five husbands, that's a lot. Back then, you were an outcast. If you were divorced, which back then, if the husband decided you didn't like the food that you cooked, you were, they would divorce you. you had no, no, women had no say in it. If you were a, a female who was a widow, you were considered nothing back then. Like, there was, like, something's wrong with you. So a Samaritan woman who's been divorced or 
or her husband left or her husband died once, it's bad enough. Five times, that's terrible. And she's with somebody now that is not her husband. So, I mean, at this point, you can kind of start to guess here that she's coming there because she doesn't want to see anybody. I mean, she's already had five husbands, and that she, that she, and she, she knows what's going to happen. So she's probably with this other person like, I'm not going to marry him. I've already had five. I already know what's going to happen with that. You think she's living a life that is satisfied? She is bound from relationship to relationship. We don't know why. We don't know what the context is, but we know that she is bound from relationship to relationship. And now she is going at a time where she would see nobody to get water. She's trying to find hope and meaning and purpose and fulfillment, but has come back feeling empty and alone and unfulfilled. She's she's ashamed of her life so much so that she has to go and nobody else will see her. She's trying to avoid everyone. Jesus knows this. That's why he calls it out. Verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped you on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Sorry. This is deflection here. She's trying to talk about something else. Like, I don't want to talk about my husband. Yeah, you're a prophet and talk, starts talking about uh, Samaritans, how they built the temple in, the Mount, in Mount Garzon in 400 B.C., but in 123 B.C., the Jews came and destroyed it. She's bringing up this stuff that really has nothing to do with the conversation. She's trying to change the subject, but listen to what Jesus says in verse 21. Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. Jesus is saying that a time of Jews being God's holy people is coming to an end because Jesus has come to save all not just Jews. We could do a whole conversation about the Old Covenant, Old Testament versus the New Covenant. But here's what he's saying. The Old Covenant, the Old Testament that we all follow, Jesus says, no, that time is over because I'm here. I'm not here just for the Israelites. I'm not here for just for the Jews. I'm here for everyone. I'm here for everyone. The woman said in verse 25, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Listen, prophet, I know, I know the story. I know my My parents taught me this. I know from my history that the Messiah is coming. I know he is. And when he comes, all these things will be explained. We will be able to figure it all out. When he shows up, then we will know the truth. What is is she saying? Someday, the person is going to show up and make everything clear. Someday, we will have all the answers. Someday. Listen to how Jesus responds in verse 26. I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Someday isn't coming. Today is here. And standing in front of you right now is the one you have been waiting for. I'm not here to answer all things. I am here to give you life, true fulfillment and satisfaction. I have come to give you purpose. I have come to rescue you. See, what we have to understand is this. God doesn't want you to live a life that you are always focused on someday so that you don't focus on today. God wants you to live a life on purpose today, to feel whole today, to feel satisfied today, to feel fulfilled today, not someday, the someday that's never going to come, but today. It starts with what you find your satisfaction in. See, God knows you. In fact, God knows all there is to know about you, and He still loves you. Those secrets that no one knows that you keep, he knows it. He still loves you. The struggles that you have that none of us know about, the struggles that you have daily, he knows it. He still loves you. He knows the thoughts that you would be terrified if anybody found out. He knows it, and he still loves you. He knows it all, and he still chooses to love you. He loves you so much that he decided to send his son for you, that he saw your biggest need, that you could never do anything about it, and I could never do anything about it, so he sent his son so that we could have a relationship with him. God doesn't love the someday you. He loves the today you, the one with all the struggles, the one with all the hurts, with all the pain, with all the things that you are dealing with. He loves that you. The creator of the universe looks at you and loves you exactly as you are. And when God looks at you and he sees you living a life focused on someday or struggling 
with things that, that, are, that you think are going to give you fulfillment when they really aren't. When he sees you doing that, he says what he says to the Samaritan woman. Stop trying to find fulfillment in this world and find fulfillment in the one thing that can satisfy you. Everyone thinks that we're seeking meaning in life. No matter what you believe, all of us are trying to find some kind of meaning or purpose, whether you believe in Jesus or not, um, whether you're atheist, whether you believe in another religion, we all want some kind of meaning or purpose in life. We all just do. It's, it's in us. It's natural to us. We all want that. We're all seeking some kind of purpose in life. But when you live a life that fulfills your purpose, that you think fulfills your purpose, but it's not according to God, you're not going to find fulfillment in that. We think that if I just live my calling, live my purpose, then I'll finally be fulfilled it's not true. Purpose doesn't give you fulfillment. The only thing that truly fulfills you and satisfies you is abiding in your heavenly Father. That's it. God has a purpose for you, but it isn't that your that's not where you get your fulfillment. God has a plan for you, but obeying God's plans does not give you fulfillment in life. It's finding rest in your Creator. He alone is our fulfillment. God is our fulfillment. God is our purpose. God is our plan. God gives you a choice in life to free will so that you can, have, you can choose your purposes, you can choose your path you go down. He gives us that. But at the end of the day, your fulfillment needs to be in Christ alone. Nothing else. So the disciples, they were going on a Chipotle run. They eventually came back, and they're like, all right, hey, we're, we're back. And he sees Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. And then the Samaritan woman starts responding to Jesus. Verse 28 says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? She found fulfillment, the fulfillment that she had been looking for for so long, and she left everything behind. She stopped what she was doing, she, she stopped getting her water and she left because she had to tell everybody about the fulfillment she found in Christ. See, following Jesus is not about being the right Christian person. It's not about obeying the right rules, voting the right way, looking the right way, and being perfect. That's not what it's about. It's understanding who you are in relationship with, who you follow, who gives you fulfillment, and responding accordingly. If our response is to follow Jesus while still living a life that doesn't fulfill us, then we are minimizing Jesus to a religion rather than a God who is our ultimate fulfillment and ultimate satisfaction. After the Samaritan woman leaves, the disciples who just got back from getting their food said, Jesus, hey, here's your, here's your food. You, you got to eat. You're, you're probably hungry. Jesus replies to them, my food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Here's what Jesus is doing here. He's taking an opportunity to teach the disciples something. Take this opportunity after you just talked to this Samaritan woman and, and told her about everlasting water. Taking this opportunity, and he's using a metaphor that they would understand while also bringing up the old covenant and how the old covenant got us to where we are, the, the work that they had done got us to where we are now. And he's trying to teach them something very important, something that I think we need to learn. And here's what it is. We cannot know complete satisfaction until we find our satisfaction in him. We cannot know it. If you want complete satisfaction, complete fulfillment, it has to start in him. We cannot know complete satisfaction until we find our satisfaction in him. You want satisfaction and fulfillment? Jesus told his disciples how to have it. By finding your fulfillment in him and living on mission. By going out and spreading the news of Jesus, just like that Samaritan woman did when she found it, she went and had to tell everybody about what she experienced. By doing that, by telling everyone about the one who truly satisfies us, the one who loves the today version of us, the one who gives us hope. Much of our satisfaction is connected with committing to God who sent us on a mission. Um, I've never heard anyone at the end of their life, and I've been to 
funerals. I've been to bedsides. I've been to hospitals as people are going from this life to the next. I never, ever heard anyone tell me, know what I regret most? How much I served people. You know what I regret most? All the time I spent with God. You know what I regret most? All the times that I just spent praying on my face, submitting to God. I, I've never heard that, but here's what I've heard multiple times. I regret how much time I wasted. I regret how much time I wasted about me. So as we conclude today and we get ready to sing our, our closing song, I want to ask you one last question. Are you fulfilled today? Are you fulfilled today? And I ask you this, but I'm also asking myself this, because as I was um, preparing this, I was thinking about where I tend to find my fulfillment personally. Um, it's easy for me to find my fulfillment in my marriage, because I love my wife. It's easy for me to do that. But what were to happen if all of a sudden we're struggling? What were to happen if all of a sudden she's not around? Where's my fulfillment? It's gone. It's easy for me to find my fulfillment in my kids. I have three kids that I love. It's easy for me to find that I have plans for them. I'm trying to teach them things. I'm trying to guide them a certain path. I, I, have been, I pray for them every day that God's going to do something big. Every time I put them to bed, I say, I love you. Mommy loves you. God loves you. And you're going to do great things in this world because I believe it. I've been, I, I, have, I can easily find my fulfillment in my kids. But my kids have a choice. When they get older, they can go a certain path or they can go another one. And I'm going to try and help them to make the right decision, but at the end of the day, it's not my decision. So if it's all about my kids to give me fulfillment, they control it. What if they go a different way? Now all of a sudden I don't have fulfillment anymore? And here's the last one for me. It's easy for me to think about this church because I truly felt like God called me to start this church with other people. And I feel like God is calling a lot of you to be part of this church. That's why we call ourselves owners here, not members, because we own this together. Whenever someone says, hey, I like your church, if they come, I'm like, no, it's not my church. It's our church. We're together on this. I truly feel that God has called me here. And my prayer is that for those of you that are owners here, I pray that, and my hope is that God calls you to be here forever, okay? But most likely he's not going to. I pray that he calls me to stay here forever. And I hope that I die an old man and Frank sings a song on my funeral, okay? He, I eat meat, he doesn't, he's going to live longer than me, okay? That's what I hope happens. But this church and my calling is not where I find my fulfillment either. It can't be. Because what if I'm not the pastor anymore? What if this church isn't here after a while? My calling's not, my, not where I find my fulfillment either. So we get that confused as followers of Jesus. If you're here and you would say you're a follower of Jesus, we tend to think, you know what? Whenever I find my purpose in life that God has given me, that calling that God has given me, when I find that, then I'll feel fulfilled. Maybe. But God doesn't want you to find your fulfillment in your calling. He wants you to find your fulfillment in Him. That's it. To rest in Him. Because if it's about the calling, it's kind of about us. So we have control of that. We have control of that a little bit. Yeah, maybe God's going to say, hey, you're going this way and just like Jonah, you're going to go whether you want to or not. It's your choice whether you go in a boat or a fish, but you're going to go over to Nineveh. Maybe that's what God's doing for some of us. But listen, if God has a calling for you, that is great. I truly believe he does. He has a purpose and plan for you, and he's calling all of us to do something. He's calling all of us to belong to a church. He's calling all of us to do ministry in some aspect. Some of our ministry is at our work. Some of our ministry is here. He's calling all of us to do that. We don't find our fulfillment in our calling. We find it in him alone. That's it. That is, our, that is where we find our fulfillment. That is our satisfaction in life. So are you fulfilled today? Or are you dreaming about someday? Someday when I'm fulfilled. Someday when I'm satisfied. Someday when I have everything that I want. Someday when I have all the money and the right job and the right marriage and my kids. Someday. That's all about you. Someday might not ever come, but today is here. Today is here. And God doesn't want to wait for your someday. He says, I'm here right now. I want you to find your fulfillment in me right now. If you do not feel fulfilled today, or you're not sure, why spend 
one more day minimizing today and focusing on the someday that might not ever happen. You can find fulfillment in the one who created you. He is the living water. He is the hope in your life. He is the grace that you can't earn. He is the one who make, takes our mundane, boring today, that today that we that some of us are, do not feel fulfilled with. He takes that today and makes it a life on mission and on purpose with true satisfaction and true fulfillment. Today is the day. Don't wait for someday. Today is here. So are you fulfilled today? If not, the first thing I want you to do is ask yourself, why? What is it that I'm trying to find my fulfillment in? Because a lot of us are doing that, including me. What is it that I am trying to find my satisfaction in that is robbing me of true fulfillment today? What is it? The answer, whatever that answer is, I don't want you to focus on this week. If it's your job or the future job, if it's your kids, your marriage, what is it that you are trying to find fulfillment today? If you're hoping to be fulfilled someday, you're wasting your time. God is saying to you right now, don't waste any more time. Today is the day. You can find that fulfillment. Not only are you wasting today, that means you wasted yesterday. God doesn't waste any of our time. Only we do that. So today, find your fulfillment in Him. He is the living water that fully and completely satisfies you. Not someday, but today. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And I want to give you just a minute to spend time between you and God. To ask Him, if you're not sure what you're trying to find your fulfillment, but you know you don't feel fulfilled yet, this is your opportunity between you and God, nobody else. Don't talk to anyone next to you. This is an opportunity for you to connect with the Creator. To God, I want to find my fulfillment and rest in you. And once we make that decision, it's not a one-time decision. It's a daily decision. You can't say, okay, I made a decision, I'm good to go. Because tomorrow we might start thinking about someday again. It's every day we make that decision. So I want you to spend some time just you and God praying to him, the God who fully satisfies you. You just need to allow him to do it. Take this opportunity and then we'll sing together.